All right, so let's talk about homework one and homework two. So homework one, you should have created a spreadsheet for IBM and Microsoft. Now I added Google, because we had done it in class next week for just comparative purposes. But basically, following the key value driver spreadsheet, you should have estimated a G for IBM and Microsoft. So you'd have gotten the expected net income and adjusted from Bloomberg. So for example, if you had typed in IBM, U.S. equity off the EEO screen. You would have used second forward year, forward year one, forward year two, net income adjusted. Today it's 12.537. And now it's 12.579 last week. Again, slight differences based on time. You'd have gotten the expected ROE by taking a three year average of the next three years of ROE. And you would have gone to the WAC screen. And you'd have gotten the cost of equity for IBM, which today is 10.4. And last week it was 10.4, didn't change. All right, using the formula, you'd have gotten the PE for the second forward year, also off of the EEO screen. 10.41 PE adjusted for 2019. And then basically, Today it's 10.53 last week, and solve for a G that gets them to match. So somewhere around 1.1%. And for Microsoft, 6.7. Right? Now here's the only tricky thing. Not every company has a fiscal year that ends in December. Microsoft fiscal year ends June 30th. So forward year two for Microsoft is actually 2020, All right? Forward year one is 2019. So if you remember, I said count years, and this is a, kind of a prelude to what was about to happen because some companies, Microsoft being one of them, doesn't use a traditional year end close. So for them, forward year two, they're already in 2019, starting July 1st. So for them, it would have been 2020. So therefore you would have used this number for net income adjusted and the two, FY220 PE that you needed to match to get your G. Okay? Question? So, I mean, I, I use forward year two. I use 2020 forward year two. Yep. But um, the reason that we're doing that is because they're June 30th and we get yeah. from the September. Yeah, so the idea for forward year two, and it's in the book, in the reading, they talk about how it's more normalized, but I'll just be practical is that even fiscal 2019, it's already September. So July and August are already historical. So this year is a mix between a forecast and actual performance. The first clean year is FY2. It's all forecast. So forward year two is just the convention that we are going to use, which is the first true forward forecasting year. Okay. So that's the point. This is forward year one, forward year two. I'm going to try my best in the assignments to use FY1, FY2, because I don't want to say use 2019, because that would be a different number for Microsoft than it would be for IBM, just convention. And the nice thing about Bloomberg is they do change the colors. It's subtle, but nonetheless, you can kind of see the different colors are the forward year versus the historical data. All right? Other questions? So given that, you should have gotten around the homework one. 1.1 for IBM, plus or minus a little bit, maybe a few basis points, and about 6.7 for Microsoft. Now, based on what we did in class last week, Google was about 10 and a half, okay? So I know we're not doing a lot of this yet, but later in the semester, we get into analytics on multiples, like why is Microsoft's PE close to 23 and IBM's close to 11? Like, what's the real difference about the PEs? Why does Microsoft have a much higher PE? I mean, you got the data right there. What's, what's driving it? Yeah. Yeah, it's all growth. So even though IBM has a much higher return on equity, they're not growing it. So it's that growth return combination, key value drivers, that makes them more valuable. And that's why Microsoft is actually doing a lot better and paying for a high PE. That's also why Warren Buffett sold IBM last year and actually said it was one of his worst investments he's ever made. Right? Because three years ago when he bought IBM, he thought, hey, I'm buying a great market 
but he picked the wrong horse. He picked IBM because he thought IBM was going to win the cloud. They were going to win AI. And he admitted last year, it's like, no, Amazon and Google are who I should have bought. Even Microsoft I should have bought. I chose the wrong company. So that's why he got out. And it wasn't because IBM is making money. It was because IBM is just not growing and doing as well as some of the peers. They got some really slick marketing. But when you actually look at customers, it's Amazon Web Services that's dominant in the cloud, not IBM Watson. So that's the point, and you can clearly see it here in the numbers. Now, I put the third company up here at Google, right, for another reason. And it has nothing to do with the fact that I work for them, right, or I own their stock personally. But I'll give you an example of why I own their stock personally, which is what happened to Amazon yesterday. Big news for Amazon yesterday. Yeah, they became the second trillion dollar company, right? Here's my prediction. You know who's going to be number three? Why? Look at that growth rate. That if Google maintains its growth rate, and that's a key assumption, very high growth as a $100 billion company, then, again, with those cash flows at that PE and that growth, they're next. Matter of fact, I'll make another prediction. I don't know if I'm going to be right, but I think in a year we're going to have $3 trillion companies. You know who's going to be the least valuable of the three? My prediction? Apple. Why? Yeah. Unless Tim Cook comes out in the next few months with the, hey guys, we've been working in the secret laboratory and here's the thing that we didn't tell you about, like the iPhone's not going to give them the growth. And despite their high return, that's what we learned about key value drivers, without the growth, they're not going to have the multiple. And that's the advantage that Amazon and Google have. Although, I was just checking the news story right between the uh, headlines, uh, basically the government is now investigating Amazon for antitrust. That's, that's a Trump. He wants them to, to basically investigate Amazon. Has nothing to do with the Washington Post publishing excerpts of the book. It's just, which happens to be owned by Jeff Bezos, but Amazon is going to be looked at for antitrust if Trump has anything to do with it. Now, if that actually turns out to be real, that could change things. Okay, that's what I mean by news will change things. But right now, I'm hoping that that's just you know, Trump being Trump, nothing happens out of it, and Amazon keeps dominating the way that they do. But regardless, that's what my assumption would be based on. All right, homework two. Assignments. This is pretty simple. We did these four things in class. So can you just basically write up what we did? Okay, so you could have gone back to your Excel. This is sheet number two. You could have left in the default data and basically just run through these scenarios. So scenario one, when you have a positive spread, what happens when G increases? That was company B. You get more value, higher multiple, because you're getting that exponential value on that positive spread. Scenario number two. What happens when you have a negative spread and G, G increases? So what's going to happen? Yeah, lower value, lower PE, because you're basically doing more NPV negative projects, and that is going to lower your valuation, lower your multiple, accelerating that negative growth. Scenario number three. What happens when your spread is zero and you grow? You do a bunch of NPV zero projects, you get NPV zero. And scenario number four, what happens when you have a positive spread, but G starts to decelerate? This was the example we talked about last week with Coca-Cola. Basically, it's the expectation game. I price you as if. I realize I was too optimistic. You can't generate the same value with a lower growth rate when I reprice you at the lower growth rate. And so therefore the value goes down, the multiple goes down because I'm priced against an unrealistic high expectation. That's scenario number four. Yes, sir. <clears throat> the short answer is because we're dealing with perpetuities, there's a limitation on the perpetuity that the WAC can't, or the G can't be higher than the WAC. Because we're not talking about a short period of time, we're literally talking about forever. So just put it this way. Take Google's $100 billion of revenue and cagger that by 15% forever. Then 
we all become worshipers of the great Google God. They will control the planet, all right? And I'm just saying that's unrealistic. Nobody can grow at that rate forever. And so that's why technically on a perpetuity, you won't see that. So you are bounded in a perpetuity by the whack. Okay, but it's a good point. Other questions? All right. So that was homework two. Easy. Two things I wanted you to get out of these assignments. One, general understanding the key value driver. Two, practice using Bloomberg. That was also key. Now everybody has a count. Start a little familiarity. Hopefully you started working on your certifications. Again, all assignments, including the one for next week, will involve Bloomberg. Okay? So now let's talk about homework three. And let's talk about EIC, which is lecture note two. Okay? And given our limited amount of time in the rest of the class, I'm going to try and be efficient. So lecture two, which is on ELMS under the file section, is on what's called the EIC framework. E stands for economy, I stands for industry, C stands for company. Last week, we talked about this. We said about half of the performance of any business is the industry. It's the external market. EIC gives us a framework to understand that external impact. All right? So let's start with the E or the economy. So, that's good. so the point of the E is, is simply this. A rising tide is going to help rise all the boats. Okay, so if our economy is doing better, then the companies in that economy should generally do better as well. So two questions come out of that. Question number one, what's going to happen to the economy going forward? All right, because then the companies in that economy are going to be impacted appropriately. Question number two, how tied is our company to that economy? Right? Because the economy might be doing better, but that doesn't really matter to the company that we're evaluating. So we got to look at the proxy of impact of our company to an economy. So those are the two things we're trying to assess for economic impact, and by the way, for homework three. Okay? So to do so in Bloomberg for the economy, you'll see this in your certification, but we're going to start with ECSU, which is the Economic Surprise Index or Economic Surprise Monitor within Bloomberg. Very powerful screen. So just as Bloomberg surveys the sell side analysts to generate earnings expectations for companies, Bloomberg also surveys economists to project expectation for economic data on countries going forward. And so what Bloomberg is doing is it's collecting, and you can see here on the left, 42 pieces of economic data that are being forecast by economists on the U.S. economy, which they put into six categories or buckets. So one is housing and real estate market, two, industrial, three, labor statistics, four, personal household income and other statistics, five, retail market and wholesale market indicators, and six surveys. So for example, the consumer confidence index is in the surveys. So based on these 42 data points, they have an overall algorithm, which they call the Bloomberg Surprise Index. So here's the general idea on the right, which is, I'm gonna look at the left. So let's take labor market as an example. So on the 30th of August, there was a forecast for initial jobless claims, initial unemployment people filing for unemployment claims, and the number came in at 213,000 people. Now, this was slightly worse than what was expected. So more people filed for unemployment on August than was originally predicted by the analysts. This is what happened to the market that day, and after the news was released, the market was up, news released, market went down. So obviously, if we had more unemployment than we thought, then think about these all things else being equal, and I know they never are, but all things else being equal, market's probably going to do a little worse, so the market went down. So that's the idea. So what Bloomberg is doing is as data comes in, they know what the forecast is. When it comes out, how do they do against forecast? So for example, on the 3rd of August, there was change in non-farm payrolls. 
came in a little worse than expected. You know, uh, here's another one, ADP employment. ADP, one of the biggest payroll people in the country. So basically, if they looked at how many people uh, were getting employment change based from ADP jobs, again, same thing with 219,000. That was a little bit better than expected. But here's the point. Look over here on the right. The white line is the index of those 42 indicators. The yellowish orange gold line is the S&P 500 index. So here's the idea. When there's been positive economic news, positive surprises, the market goes up. When there's been negative economic news against expectation, the market's been going down. So that's why this is a powerful page. Because just like stocks, when companies do better than what they're expected to do, generally their price goes up. When companies do worse than they're expected to do, the price goes down. So here's how this will play out. People expect the fourth quarter of the U.S. economy to do pretty well. But what matters is not that it does well. Is it going to do better than expected or worse than expected? That's what's going to cause the market to change. By the way, hint, 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 that's what would matter to your Bloomberg trading competition. right? Because that's how you're going to win, is that you just have to think about sentiment and whether the market has it right. And change of sentiment is going to drive change of performance. Everybody with me? So once we look at this data, we then go to question number two. How sensitive is the company that we're evaluating to the market? So for example, yesterday I was in Oslo, Norway, working with SAS Airlines. Okay, so they're an airline, European airline. So how do we measure an airline's sensitivity to the market? What factor would we use? Yes? We're going to use beta. We're going to use beta. Okay, we're oversimplifying it, but the whole idea is a transit of property. Is the market is tied to the, um, to the economy, the company is tied to the market through the beta, therefore by proxy, company tied to the market. So what does it mean when SAS, you go to the company, and type, and then you type in beta, and Bloomberg will calculate for you a real-time beta of the company you're looking at. It will regress the company's change in stock price against a market index. In this case, it's the Stockholm Market Index. It's done on a weekly basis for two years by default. If I want to do it for five years weekly, if I want to do it for five years daily, imagine what you had to do at 340, okay? How fast this is, right? And so basically, that's the beta. Except what I want you to do is not use the beta screen. I want you to go to the RV screen because this will have the peers for SAS in Europe. So it's got Lufthansa, it's got EasyJet, it's got Norwegian Air Shuttle, which is their biggest competitor in the Scandinavian Airlines, it's got Ryanair, etc. This is um, British Air. Okay? So it's got the big major European airlines. So here's the point. If I go to the Markets tab, there's a sub-tab called Beta, which will give me the beta for every one of those peers, and the first line, an industry average. So now, and this is one of the most powerful things Bloomberg can do, is I can quickly get an industry average beta for the industry that I look at. Now to get that, what you have to do is once you're on the screen in the RV, go to settings, and then global settings, and make sure that under display, you check the box, market cap weighted average. So if you check that box, every time you go to a different RV screen, the very first row, Bloomberg will calculate a market cap weighted average. I don't want you to calculate average, and I'll do that just to show it to you, so when you close, it'll show it to you, because that one does not adjust for size. Now, it doesn't make too much of a difference in this industry, but sometimes you might have some big companies and small companies, and the average would throw it off. So I want you to adjust it for size, so don't check average. All right, but once it's there, every time you go to a screen, the first line is the industry average. Now, you're also going to see something called the raw beta and the adjusted beta, right? There are religious wars in statistics, right? There's lies, damn lies in statistics. Even statisticians can't agree on how to do statistics. And so I'm just going to keep it simple. So the raw beta is the actual slope of that regression line. So when you draw that trend line, that slope is the raw beta. 
But statisticians believe in a regression to the mean. So what they do is they put in a regression coefficient to smooth the line out and move it closer to the mean. So in Bloomberg, the regression coefficient is what's called the adjusted beta. What they do is they take two-thirds of the raw and one-third of one. So basically what they're doing is they're taking the beta and they're moving it one-third closer to the mean. Right? And I don't want to get into an argument about which one's better at actually predicting market beta going forward. So we're not. And I'm just going to choose raw. For purposes of the E in the EIC, we're going to use raw beta because what we're trying to answer is how sensitive is a company to changes in the market and the actual line is their sensitivity for the last two years. So what does that mean? SAS and the market. The airlines for Europe have a beta of 0.88. What does that mean? Now let's look at, we're going to look at the market first, not SAS. So the market of the airlines. The 0.88. In general, it's So if the market goes up by one, stock 600 in this case, then these airlines go up by 0.88. If the market goes down by 1%, they go down by 0.88. So they're going to be a little less sensitive, but they're still sensitive to the market, but a little less sensitive than the market. However, SAS is 1.03. So when the average airline goes up 0.88, SAS goes up 1.03. So here's a little bit of context. SAS caters towards premium business travelers. All right? That's probably why they're a little bit more economically sensitive, because in bad times, you tend to get cutbacks on corporate business travel. In good times, there's more corporate business travel. And that's probably why SAS's beta is a little bit higher. I wouldn't expect you to have known that, and I didn't really know that until I started working with them. But the point of the story is they are a little bit more sensitive. But again, we care about the market. Now, you're asking why are we worried so much about this? Fast forward a few weeks. If we were trying to do a valuation of SAS and we're trying to do a forecasted cash flow, then how much of what happens to the economy is going to influence how much we're going to think about the changes in those forecasted cash flows? This is what this is setting up by the way. Does that make sense? So I want you to use the raw, and I want you to talk about the economic sensitivity of the industry against the company that I assigned you. That's the first part of homework three. Okay? So give me an example of a company that might be very sensitive to changes in the economy. Who would be a high beta company or industry? Yeah. So give me an example. Give me a company. GMC. All right. So let's look at GM. Auto industry? One point oh three. They tend to go up and down with the economy. GM one point one. So a little bit more. <clears throat> I'll give you one. Square. Mobile payment platform. So I told you I bought Square. Here's my risk. Is it the economy does well? Square should do really well. But if the economy stops doing well, people don't swipe as many credit cards, it's going to be really bad for Square. That's what the high beta suggests. So they're much more sensitive to particularly the retail market than the other companies, even within the industry that we're looking at. Does that make sense? If I wanted to do a defensive portfolio, I'm worried about the market. What would be a low volatility industry? Less economically sensitive. Water. What water? Give me a water company. I don't, I don't know. All right, let's talk about Coke or Pepsi. Let's look at PepsiCo. Beverages. 0.48. Okay, Curing. Negative 2.1. There's your defensive stock. Coffee. People just addicted to caffeine, no matter what the market is. They're going to still buy their $4 coffee or their little cup or whatever they're called. Yes? Isn't that negative beta? Isn't that negative beta? Exactly. That's your natural hedge. Market goes down, they go up. Okay. There's very few negative beta stocks out there. We just found one. But the point is, <clears throat> that's the idea, is thinking about economic sensitivity, how sensitive, and more important, how sensitive is our company against its peer group. So Pepsi, a little less sensitive than even some of its other beverage peers. Okay. 
So that's E. I, let's move on to I in the interest of time. Let's say we're doing Pepsi. RV. Then what we do is we go here to custom and attracted just the industry we talked about last week is spread. So ROIC, latest year. So we're all looking at the same data set. So last year, 2017. And then WAC. And then spread. Is this an attractive industry? Yes, because it has a positive spread. Does PepsiCo show competitive advantage? Yes, because their spread is actually a little bit better than the industry. That's how you answer that question. Now here's question 2B. Why? Porter Five Forces. You guys all know it. If you don't, look it up. But here's the point. Explain the spread. Why? In the context of Five Forces, is this industry attractiveness? Is it buyer power? Is it supplier power? Is it lack of substitutes? Is it entry into the industry is difficult? Is it rivalry amongst the players? Using those five forces, explain that spread. All right, so you might say something like, well, gee, it's hard to get shelf space in supermarkets, so therefore, there's a big barrier to entry. Gee, there's not that many beverage companies, and there's not that much competition amongst them. They generally don't compete on price. They compete on marketing or brand. They don't compete on price. That tends to help the industry. But explain the spread. And then here's 2C. What's it going to look like in five years? Because that's what I'm really trying to get to. It's not just the spread today. Is the spread of this industry going to look like this in five years? Is it going to get better? Is it going to stay the same? Is it going to get worse? And more importantly, why? In the context of the five forces, is it going to get worse because barriers to entry are coming down and substitutes like water are going to be increasing threats to this and other things might change the industry like regulation? Like some of the things that you have to forecast, it's a little bit more qualitative, but I want you to basically make a prediction based on facts about what the industry looks like in five years and what it means to the industry spread in general. That's homework three, by the way. Questions? The only thing I didn't give you yet is the company, which you get later today. Okay, so here's what I'll mention for SAS. This is what I learned about SAS and some of the conversation I had with them yesterday. All public. Yes? Well, as I said, ultimately it's going to be buyer power, supplier power, rivalry, uh, threat of new entrants, and substitutes. One of the things, rivalry, look at how many players are on the list. Look at how many people they actually have to compete with. Look at how many people and how profitable those peers are. Because they got a lot of low margin peers, well, that's probably more indicative of more rivalry. All right, you're going to have to think through substitutes, depending on the industry. All right, so you have to use some common sense here. By the way, you have pub, this is real stuff. You can go to Bico, Bloomberg Intelligence. You can go to, um, on Elms, you can get industry reports uh, from, what's the service? Ibis World. Like, there's nothing wrong with using real world data to help you. Don't plagiarize, source it, and that's okay, as you're trying to help explain this stuff. Like, I don't expect that no one's ever done something on Pepsi before. They've done a lot in this industry. Leverage it, just don't plagiarize it. Okay, so source it. So let's talk about SAS to kind of help with this example. So here's one thing I learned, and you can see it right here on the spread screen, and this is actually important to your assignment. So first, the reason why I want you to do the industry spread is I want to get past bias. All right, here's what I mean by that. Most people think that airlines perform poorly, but for the last few years, Airlines have actually been performing quite well. And so there's the problem. If we use our bias, airlines are a horrible industry. If we look at data, airlines are actually a pretty good industry. So that's the point. Use observed data to explain attractiveness of industries. Second thing, why is SAS in the market doing relatively well? Well, here's something I learned. If you look at EEO, about 20% of an airline's total cost is fuel. So if you look at the airline subtab of EEO, last year they spent about 6.9 billion, and this is uh, Swedish Krona. This year, 8 billion. Next year, almost 10 billion. 
between 18 and 19, their fuel costs are expected to go up by 2 billion krona. Okay? Now, to put that into perspective, their sales next year, between 18 and 19, are expected to go up by 1.5 billion krona. So, revenue up a billion five, fuel up 2 billion. All right? That's going to be tough, not just on SAS, it's going to be tough on the industry. So rising oil prices are projected to hurt the industry. So here's the point. What if oil goes back to 45? Is that going to help or hurt the airlines? It's going to help a lot. What if oil goes to 100? It's going to crush them. There's your point. Supplier power, particularly the oil, is going to have a huge impact on airline performance. Why are the airlines doing well in the last few, day, few years? Because oil prices went down. And so if I really want to project SAS more than anything else, what's the price of oil going to be in the next couple of years? Because that is going to be the big driver of how airlines perform. Okay? And right now, I know they got $2 billion of cost and a billion of revenue, going after revenue. So even without being in the room, you could project that they're probably doing something to address that gap so that their earnings don't fall. Okay? And it's either through higher revenue or through lower cost. By the way, you can also see in the competition, the biggest competition is Norwegian Airlines, which is basically like the southwest of Europe. Okay, so it's a low cost player. And here's what's interesting, is that the spread of Norwegian Air is negative. They're, they're losing and destroying value because they're basically buying a bunch of market share by having very ultra low prices. So that's the point. Do I want to grow the negative spread business by matching their price and getting a bunch of leisure travelers? Is that going to help my share price? What's the answer to that question? We just did a key value driver that says growing a negative spread is not going to help you. But the question is, do I file them off the cliff because then they get the market share? Are they able to raise price and then I'm in trouble if they get an economy of scale? These are real strategic questions companies have to deal with and we have to assess financial impact. So again, back to EIC, play this out and think what's going to happen to this market in five years. You've got to make a guess. I'm not saying you're perfect. But that's what we have to try and do as analysts, because it's not just about today, it's about forecasting. So that's what our assignment is going to start practicing this Questions about the assignment? So, homework three, individual. Yes? There's like no description on the Nope. Okay. There will be later today, because I don't want you to do it during class. So this is an individual assignment as homework three. Individual means by yourself. So no sharing screenshots with other people. You're going to have to go in, get the screenshots, basically answer the questions on the beta using the market screen, as well as the RV competitive advantage or the attractors of the industry and whether the company has competitive advantage today and in five years, explained it with the five forces. All right. You'll also work with your teams to start working on group project one. And I'll just tell you that the assignment that I'm giving you is actually coming from the analyst training program at McKinsey. So if you get hired by McKinsey, you might see this assignment again. It's got some worksheets. You'll fill in the worksheets as a group. You'll answer the essay questions. You'll submit that by next Friday. Okay? So make sure you work on those two and finish your Bloomberg certification by next Friday as well. All right? So again, see you guys in a couple weeks.